Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Eat it. <laughs> Good morning. In our, in our bulletin, our little prayer is, our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. That hits me at home right now because I really didn't want to come up here and do this. So I praise God for that. So let's just open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you, Lord, so much for this day for this time to come and worship you, this time to fellowship with other believers. We pray now, dear Father, be with us and be with the pastor in the sermon this morning and the prayer team as they're singing. Thank you, dear God, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. With my heart rejoicing within, with my mind focused on Him.
come on and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Come on and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. That's an annual thing as well as a daily thing. We'll get to celebrate an Easter here in a couple months, but we can celebrate every day the resurrection of our Lord. Welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. We prayerfully are here to build relationships to impact lives with the transforming power of Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. That's why we are here. Everything that we are doing, we want us to filter that through that mission, and that is to build relationships, prayerfully build relationships, so we can impact lives with the transforming power of Christ. We have activities, meetings even, committee meetings, believe it or not, are designed around that so we can have ministries that are built with excellence, not just, well, that date's coming up, we better do something. And so we want you to be prayerfully praying for this congregation, the committees, the Sunday school classes, the kids' clubs, the worship services, the leadership, and pray where God might use you. Because um, many times, that is not what we're looking for, but that's exactly where God's going. So be praying, Lord, how can I be used for the kingdom of God within this context of this congregation, the community, and my life in general? We do have a number of things that are happening in our worship service and in our week and weeks to come. So I'm going to ask you to read your bulletin. We've got divorce care. We have Alpha Course coming up. We have Secret Pal Party coming up. Lord, all that stuff's in your bulletin. I think everybody I know here knows how to read, so I'm going to put it there. Okay? I do want to remind you, and it's a part of our bylaws also, that we have to announce when our annual meeting's coming up. That's on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. How appropriate for a church, right? We're going to share Valentine's together at a meeting. And so uh, we want you to be there. Now, if you're not a member, and what I mean is you're not in the membership roles, you attend here, you're an adherent is what that's called, but you haven't gone through the membership course, the class, and so forth, we still want you there because we want you to know what's going on. We want you to hear the reports of how God's been moving and what the future holds. And so that's going to take place following the worship service on February 14th. Other announcements are there. I'm going to ask our ushers if they'll come forward at this time. Uh, just a reminder to those who are on the nominating committee, we're going to meet briefly after the service. It won't take us long, but we do have to just tie up some loose ends. And so please um, be, uh, just meet me after the service over by my office. I got the heater on this time so we can stay warm in there. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Father God, Lord, that's exciting. You are risen. Lord, you are not an icon. You are not a legend. You are not just a religion. You are truth. And you, oh God, came to earth as a baby born of the Virgin Mary. God, you lived the life of a human being but without sin and became the ultimate sacrifice for us who are in sin. Thank you. Thank you for the power that you hold that death cannot keep you for the love that you hold and that you do not allow us to remain in our sin, but you call to us to repent and to embrace Jesus. So, Father, I just pray now that you will help us to live our life with excellence as we enter into this theme for the year. Help us to understand what that means in our everyday life, in the life where nobody else is watching, just us and you, what that means. Father, I pray that you'll be with those of our congregation who are going through life issues, Lord. Many of them are going through illnesses issues. We think of Joyce Dagg, Lord, with the infection she's fighting, and she still has to go through the chemo. And, and Lord, I know that is very heavy on her emotions and her heart. And we pray, God, that you'll give her great spirits and lift her spirits, but, Lord, more than that, bring healing to her body. I pray for Joyce Nelson, Lord, who is recovering from that hip surgery. And God... Help her to be, I know <laughs> every time I see her, Lord, she's just this bundle of joy, even though she's talking about her pain. And I don't understand how that works, except that, Christ, you are in her. And I pray that you will bring, remove the pain and heal her body. Let the therapy do its thing and let her get back home soon. 
Lord, there are others that are going through issues that we may not even are aware of, or those that are going through life issues of suffering, sickness, loss of relationship, or loss of someone else's life. And God, we know that you are the God that brings a healing, not just in the form of spiritual healing from sin and renewal and redemption in Christ, but Lord, a healing from sickness, a healing from emotional trauma, a healing from damaged emotions. And God, I just pray that we will recognize that you are that God for us and we will embrace you and not just kind of hope, well, whatever, but truly walk by faith. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you here. Thank you for allowing us to give our voices and the instruments, our, our, our actual persons, our offerings. Lord, it's all an expression of how much we love you. So we ask that you are blessed and ask that you would guide us now through this service so that we will hear from your spirit and apply it to our lives, what you want for us. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. power and love as we sing holy 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 open the eyes of my heart lord open the eyes of my heart i want to see you i want to see you open the eyes of my heart lord open the eyes of my heart power and love as we sing holy 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 i want to see
and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh Father, where we need change, I pray that you would speak to us this morning as individuals, also as a congregation. Help us, Lord God, to carry ourselves in such a fashion that it brings great joy to you. That we are honorable and how we conduct ourselves in day-to-day life issues. That truly people will see us and they would be reminded of Jesus because of how we live our life. Speak to us, Lord, about what it means to be a person of excellence. We pray in your name. Amen. Last year, uh, year, about this time, we shared with you that uh, we declared, kind of self-imposed, if you will, or self-declared, 2015 as the year of blessing. And then each communion service, we had the benevolent blessing basket, and you were invited to uh, bless somebody else. And we heard some marvelous stories of blessing as we gave gifts to those individuals, And I didn't know this is what was going to happen, but last Sunday was the first Sunday of the month. We had communion, and afterwards I was gently accosted by some of you and said, I was ready today to give a blessing. Why didn't we take an offering of blessing for others? And it was because we made a promise that was for the year of 2015. So I'm going to go off. Uh, chart here for a second and just ask you, is, do you want to continue that as a, as a means of what we do? or um, That is okay. We'll let you three do that. <laughs> well, we'll let the board talk about it. But here's what I'd like to say. If you did come last week and you had a blessing, a gift, an offering that you wanted to present even though you had no idea where it was going, if you still have that, let me give this as a suggestion at this point. I know that Corrine uh, Anderson had, was here a couple weeks ago and shared about the missions trip that she's going on. I don't think she's reached all of her funds yet, so if you had a blessing to give last week and we didn't give you that opportunity, I want to encourage you to, to put it in the offering plate and just write on it, Corrine's trip or something, and we will bless her as a congregation, okay? But we won't, obviously we don't have communion set up today, but you're certainly welcome to do that by turning it into the office or whatever means that you seem fit if you want to participate in that. This year, um, and I didn't even run this by the uh, elders or the governing board yet. This one was just actually, as I was running through, what should I be speaking on, Lord? What should we be looking at for the coming year? Um, The concept, the theme was a year of excellence. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty good. We would like to do that. We would like to be excellent followers of Christ. We would like to be excellent teachers if we're Sunday school or in clubs. We'd like to be excellent leaders if we have some committees that we'd lead. We'd like to be excellent neighbors. We'd like to be excellent parents. We'd like to be excellent children. Um, excellence covers a broad topic. And so we're going to look at some of those things in the next few weeks. 2 Peter 1.5, a portion of that says, In your faith supply moral excellence. So let's take that as kind of the, 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 the starting point. In your faith in Jesus Christ, 
su supply moral excellence. Merriam-Webster Webster describes excellence, defines excellence, as extremely high quality or virtue. Extremely high. So if we're saying that we are followers of Jesus Christ, then that are in our faith, then we are supply a moral quality or virtue that is extremely high. It is above the norm. So today we're going to examine the excellence of sanctification because you cannot be sanctified without, first of all, being in love and, and, and surrendering to Jesus. So we're going to start today by looking at the excellence of sanctification. Sanctification defined, and that's a, the Greek word where it's used in the scripture, is a word I can't even pronounce. I could say, well, I'll say it, you won't know if I'm right or wrong anyway. Hagedizo. Okay? I won't say it twice. That way it sounds like it's right. It means to dedicate, to separate, to set apart for God. So if we're talking about to dedicate, and it's ourselves, to separate ourselves for God with excellence, it means that anything that God we offer God must be something that is uh, incredibly wonderful and pure. Back in the old days, when when they had the actual uh, the Jews had the actual process where they would go into the outer court and then to the inner court and then they would go to the priest and he would go on their behalf into the holy holies and he was the only one allowed to present God at one point, or to present the people to God at one point. They went there because they knew that they were people of sin. The, 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 the Bible told them that. The uh, Torah told them that. They knew that there was a process in which they were supposed to come and confess and ask forgiveness for their sins and to bring a bull or a lamb or some other offering according to the law. And they could come a certain place and they could be blessed and the, and the, and the priests could do their job for them. And then the, but, the, with, but the high priest, the only one that could go in behind the veil. And it was a process that was established to help those who wanted to obey and love God to know that there's a process in which you can ask forgiveness for your sin that you needed to follow. And God would hear you and his agents or his priests would speak on their behalf, but those priests better, never, better not go into the Holy of Holies unprepared. So they had to sanctify themselves through the process of the washing of their hands and the process of prayer and the incense and so forth. They had to go through all the law so that they would not enter into the presence of God in an unholy fashion. For God does not allow sin in the camp. The reason why this is important, because the sacrifices were this symbol of the Messiah, or the ultimate sacrifice that was to come, Jesus Christ. And he would not only be able to forgive people for their sins, but this sacrifice would be able to remove that sin from those who called upon him to do so. So sanctified defined begins with this dedication to be separate, to be set apart for God. Jesus is our Savior and our sanctifier. It begins with him. Hebrews 2 says this, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom all things and through whom all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies, which is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, those who come to faith in him, are all from one Father, and for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers or sisters or family. 
In other words, a reminder that when we confess our sins to Jesus and ask him to remove those sins from us and surrender to Christ as Savior, then we become a part, we're adopted into the family of God. Now, we're created by God, but we are flawed because of sin, which we inherit and which we choose to do. And the only way that that sin can be removed is through Jesus Christ because of his shed blood and sacrifice on the cross. So this says that when we come to Christ, our sins are forgiven and they are removed from us. You've heard me tell this story before, and I like to tell it, so I'm going to say it again. And those who haven't heard it, it's brand new. But I remember in a, in a, in a setting like this, I'm asking the question, uh, rhetorical or hypothetically, I guess, I'm asking the question of the congregation, is there ever a time where a human being is completely without sin? And one dear retired missionary lady from the Alliance is sitting there and she's going, nope. And of course it gave me great discomfort to go to the next verse that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus didn't die on the cross and become the payment for our sins so that only a portion of our sins would be removed when we call upon him for salvation. It's that all sin would be removed, that we would be white as snow. We would be spotless before God because of Christ who is in us. So when I prayed back in fourth grade, when I prayed to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me from all of my sin, Jesus said, yes, Kevin, I can do that. And I will do that because I love you. And I was made new. I was made a new creature. The Bible says old things are passed away. That old life, that old sinfulness that I was embedded in, that separated me from God, was now removed because of the blood of Jesus in me. At that moment, I became sanctified, set apart, dedicated to God because of Christ who is in me. And so that is with every single person who surrenders to Christ and asks Him to forgive and repent of their sins. Hallelujah! Thank you for that. Man, what's it going to take to get you Scandinavians to get excited? It's the difference between hell and heaven. And that's not the reason we do it, but there's kind of some icing on the cake, if you will. We get to be with God in His kingdom. When we make that decision, do can we sin again after that? Yes, we can, and unfortunately, we're pretty good at it. That's why I wanted to start with this, because we can't talk about sanctification in terms of experience and understanding it unless we actually have gone into a process in which we are sanctified through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today, and I have no idea if everyone has been, I can make an assumption, but that God knows only. But if you're here today and you've never asked Christ to forgive you of your sins, and you never said, I don't want that life anymore, I want to surrender to Jesus. If you've never done that, then you're probably most likely still in your sins. Separated not unto God, but from God. Because sin separates. Well, then how do you get sanctified. You recognize that you're a sinner. You ask God, please forgive me, and I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to surrender to you, Jesus. I want you to lead my life from here on out. And Christ says, I hear your prayer. I will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is awesome. It's a big responsibility, but it is awesome. Because all of a sudden, all that burden of sin and all that that concept of knowing that we are separated from God, destined for hell for eternity, unless we have Christ in us, it's gone, it's lifted, and we're free in Christ. Now, the devil doesn't give up. He'll still come back and try to get us to live the old way. He'll still tempt us to do the things that dishonor God. 
And that's the next part of sanctification we'll be talking about next week, and that's talking about the holiness of God. But a relationship with God through the Son, Jesus Christ, starts when we surrender to Him and ask Him to forgive us and embrace Him and say, I'm going to do it your way. By the way, I'm going to be very careful how I say this, but I need to say it so it's not misunderstood. It's not saying I'm going to do it the local church way. It's I'm going to do it, Jesus, your way. The church is the body of Christ. The local church, even though we represent the full body of Christ, sometimes we get caught up in traditions and we get caught up in government and we get caught up in those things and we want those to be right but sometimes they're not and you know why because sin enters in again the neat thing is, is that what jesus died once and for all was resurrected once and for all so when we pray to receive christ we if we sin if we fail him we don't have to go back and say god i need you as my savior again he will forgive us completely, but we will need to go back and ask Him to forgive us so that we can maintain this level of sanctification that sets us apart unto God. That happens as we surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that next week. So, that's, that, so Jesus is our Savior, our sanctifier. Here's, here's sanctification applied. This is the virtue of Christ found for us in the book of Hebrews. And I'll explain this as we go along. For the law, and that's now talking about the Torah, if you will, the Ten Commandments, those things. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offered continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. And after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And by this we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So we're talking here in Hebrews about the old process of coming to the priest and going through the sacrifices of bull and sheep, etc. And Jesus is saying that those things did not forgive people of their sin, or did not cleanse people from their sins, it only reminded them that they were sinful and they had to come back again and again and again and again through the process of this sacrificial offering. God has made it clear that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice who will not only forgive you of your sins but will cleanse you from all that sin and make you a different person, transform you and I in Christ. Verse 11 of chapter 10. Every priest's stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice, Jesus, for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, the Father, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after, saying, and we're going to get that in a second. So here it is. The sanctification comes through not the offering of bulls and sheep and those kind of things, but through the Son of God, God incarnate, Jesus Christ. And it's an offering that is made once, and it's eternal. It doesn't have to happen again. Jesus doesn't have to come back and die a second time. And when we surrender to that and repent and ask Christ to forgive us, we enter into 
and are adopted into the family of God. And he can call us brothers and sisters. That is the virtue of Christ. To redeem people from their sins. To break the curse of sin that says the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. To bring into us the virtue of Christ and His Holy Spirit so that we are set apart from sin and now set apart unto God. Do you see why I am talking about the excellence of sanctification? It begins with this wonderful work of redemption. The work then that we should strive with excellence to maintain by daily surrendering to Christ. Hebrews 10 goes on, well, go back to 15, it says, And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, and this is the continuance of that, now we're talking about the gift of Christ, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. And he then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. You don't have to keep coming back, hoping that Jesus is true to his word. He says, when I come, I'm going to make this final. And so now, instead of being reminded year after year with these different offerings of my sin and that I need to go back, now the conscience that the law used to bring, is now embedded in our mind and our heart by the Holy Spirit. We know, not instinctively, but by the Holy Spirit, how we are to live our life. I remember when I was a kid, I used to ask my mom, Mom, how do I know if I should do something or not? She said, if you have to stop to ask if it's wrong, it probably is. Because the Spirit of God is embedding in your mind, in your heart, truth. To live a sanctified life on a daily basis because of Christ who lives in me. That is the gift that Christ has given us. And then there's the command that Christ gives us. This is found in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now again, put in perspective of the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, and the holy place place. The holy place, there's the veil. Only the high priest was allowed to go into the holy place. He represented all of Israel. Only he was allowed to go into that holy place. Therefore, beloved brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Do you hear what that's just said? Every one of us can go into the holy place, can go into that place to be in the presence of God. Not as someone who's there on our behalf. Jesus opened up, it goes on to say, that Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. Remember the veil, when Jesus died, what happened when the earthquake happened? The veil that was in the, in the Jewish temple, what happened to it? Three feet thick, <laughs> ripped in half. God says we're doing things differently now. The veil now is Jesus Christ. The way to get to the Father is through the Son. He's the veil. And when we surrender to Jesus, we are invited into the presence of the Most Holy God, our Creator, because we have been redeemed from our sins through Jesus Christ. He has inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that is Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That is, that is again, using those symbols that were used in the Old Testament process of offering sacrifices. They would sprinkle the blood and they would wash the elements with the blood to purify them in the name of, according to the Scriptures. And now that's all happened through Jesus Christ. We have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. In other words, if I can paraphrase, 
Let us live our sanctified life with excellence. Set apart high esteem and virtue. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. A part of our part of of being sanctified in Christ is not just for us, but it's also to encourage and, and, and stimulate one another to live this excellent life of sanctification. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. In other words, not gathering together with fellow believers, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There is a divine purpose why we meet together as a local body of believers. And here it is right here. It's to stimulate one another in this faith of Jesus Christ to live and continue to walk in the sanctified life. Through love, it says, and good deeds. So how does that go back to the way we started the message? In your faith, the sanctified life, supply moral excellence, extremely high quality and virtue, so that we would stimulate one another and work ourselves in living a day-by-day excellence of sanctification, helping each other in the process. And as we begin a year of excellence, we must ask the question, and this is the application part, Am I living and demonstrating a sanctified life of excellence? Worship team, come forward, please. That is a very powerful self-examination question. Hearing a message is good. But unless we begin to to apply its principles, if we haven't been, it has no value. The question as we get into this life of excellence, excellence in 2016, it begins with the sanctified life. We can't really have a life of excellence unless Christ is in us. And once we surrender to Christ, what are we doing with that? Am I applying this excellence of sanctification, this this incredible redemption from sin to my job, to my family, to my sport, to my hobby, to my family, to my neighborhood, to the marketplace, to the post office, to the school that I attend? Or am I leaving this sanctified life, I'm reserving it for Sunday morning? And I come in and I feel real good about being around these friends and this is great. And then I go home and I live kind of what I want. God calls us to a life of excellence because Christ is excellent. He is. He is above all things. We celebrated this morning in song, didn't we? He wants us to also celebrate Him by how we live our daily life every day, every moment of the day. The word choices we use, do they reflect the excellency of Christ? The attitude we have, the emotions that run through us, what we do with our eyes and what we listen to with our ears, do they demonstrate the excellence of Christ? You and me know that answer because Christ has already written his life in our heart. We know where we stand before God. So what I'm asking this morning as we sing this final song, that you would take this opportunity, if you need to, to, ask, to examine yourself or to ask God, Lord, or, to, or confess to God if there's something you know instinctively is there, and say, God, I have held this back or I have done this. And it does not prove, it does not demonstrate the excellence of my sanctification that you have given me. Or perhaps maybe you're here and you've never prayed to receive Christ as your Savior. 
you've never surrendered to him, you've never dealt with that sin issue that lingers in everybody's life when they're born and lived out until they surrender to Christ. And today the Holy Spirit's saying, I've, I've opened your eyes, I've given you truth, you need to surrender to it this morning. And you want to do that? Then you just pray where you're at and say, Jesus, I don't quite understand all of it, but I understand that I am separated from God and I want Christ to redeem me. And I, I confess my sin and I ask you to take it away. And now I want to live for Christ. And if you do that this morning, then share that with somebody so they can help you grow in that new wonderful life called salvation. Let's pray. Father God, um, as your servant, you know that, that uh, I would love to say that I'm perfect every day. <laughs> we know that ain't true. We know there's times, God, that in my, even my own life, that I, I kind of slip away from that glory of your joyous sanctification, and I maybe allow my attitude or maybe a words or maybe my, how I conduct myself to not truly reflect the excellence of Jesus Christ in me. And I pray you forgive me for that. And I pray, God, this morning that you would be with us who are here, that we would hear what your Spirit is saying to us about our sanctified life and how we need to maintain that at a level of excellence. And we know that with your spirit, we can do it. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So be blessed. Challenge us now, Lord. Give us opportunity to demonstrate this excellence of Christ in us. And if there is someone today that has prayed to receive Christ, Lord, let them be filled with the exhilaration of your spirit, cleansing them from all unrighteousness. This I pray in the marvelous name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand as we close with our final song?
the pain and the sorrow can be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing come lord jesus come Thank you so much for reminding us of the hope that is ours in Christ. The life of joy and actually exhilaration that we can find in Jesus. Even in the midst of some deepest, darkest experiences in life, God, you're with us to give us an internal peace that cannot be explained apart from the glory of God. I just pray, Lord, that we will live that life of Christ out day to day. Give us the strength and understanding to do that. And thank you for your presence here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace.